Section 14 of Famous Adventures and Prison Escapes of the Civil War by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 14. A Hard Road to Travel Out of Dixie. Part 2. Filling our haversacks with the fragments, we took grateful leave of our sable benefactors and resumed our journey, retracing our steps to the point of disagreement of the evening before. Long experience in night marching had taught us extreme caution. We had advanced along the new road but a short way when we were startled by the barking of a house dog. Apprehending that something was moving in front of us, we instantly withdrew into the woods. We had scarcely concealed ourselves when two cavalrymen passed along, driving before them a prisoner. Aware that it was high time to betake ourselves to the crossroads and describe a wide circle around the military station at Pickensville, we first sought information. A ray of light was visible from a hut in the woods, and believing from its humble appearance that it sheltered friends, my companions lay down in concealment while I advanced to reconnoiter. I gained the side of the house, and, looking through a crack in the boards, saw to my surprise a soldier lying on his back before the fire, playing with a dog. I stole back with redoubled care. Thoroughly alarmed by the dangers we had already encountered, we decided to abandon the roads. Near midnight of December 16, we passed through a wooden gate on a level road leading into the forest. Believing that the lateness of the hour would secure us from further dangers, we resolved to press on with all speed, when two figures with lighted torches came suddenly into view. Knowing that we were yet unseen, we turned into the woods and concealed ourselves behind separate trees at no great distance from the path. Soon the advancing lights revealed two hunters, mere lads, but having at their heels a pack of mongrel dogs, with which they had probably been pursuing the coon or the possum. The boys would have passed unaware of our presence, but the dogs, scurrying along with their noses in the leaves, soon struck our trail and were instantly yelping about us. We had possessed ourselves of the name of the commanding officer of the neighboring post at Pendleton, and advanced boldly, representing ourselves to be his soldiers. Then where did you get them blue pantaloons? They demanded, exchanging glances, which showed they were not ignorant of our true character. We coolly faced them down and resumed our march leisurely, while the boys still lingered undecided. When out of sight, we abandoned the road and fled at the top of our speed. We had covered a long distance through forest and field before we heard in our wake the faint yelping of the pack. Plunging into the first stream, we dashed for some distance along its bed. Emerging on the opposite bank, we sped on through marshy fields, skirting high hills and bounding down through dry watercourses, over shelving stones and accumulated barriers of driftwood. Now panting up a steep ascent, and now resting for a moment to rub our shoes with the resinous needles of the pine, always within hearing of the dogs, whose fitful cries varied in volume in accordance with the broken conformation of the intervening country. Knowing that in speed and endurance we were no match for our four-footed pursuers, we trusted to our precautions for throwing them off the scent, mindful that they were but an ill-bred kennel and the more easily to be disposed of. Physically we were capable of prolonged exertion, Fainter and less frequent came the cry of the dogs, until, ceasing altogether, we were assured of our escape. At Okany, on Sunday, December 18, we met a negro well acquainted with the roads and passes into North Carolina, who furnished us information by which we traveled for two nights, recognizing on the second objects which, by his direction, we avoided, like the house of Black Bill McKinney, and going directly to that of friendly old Tom Hancock. The first of these two nights we struggled up the foothills and outlying spurs of the mountains through an uninhabited waste of rolling barrens along an old stage road, long deserted, and in places impassable to a saddle mule. Lying down before morning, high up on the side of the mountain, we fell asleep to be awakened by thunder and lightning, and to find torrents of hail and sleep beating upon our blankets. 
Chilled to the bone, we ventured to build a small fire in a secluded place. After dark, and before abandoning our camp, we gathered quantities of wood, stacking it upon the fire, which, when we left it, was a wild tower of flame, lighting up the whole mountainside in the direction we had come, and seeming, in some sort, to atone for a long succession of shivering days in tireless bivouac. We followed the same stage road through the scattering settlement of Cashers Valley in Jackson County, North Carolina. A little farther on, two houses of hewn logs with verandas and green blinds just fitted the description we had received of the home of old Tom Hancock. Knocking boldly at the door of the farther one, we were soon in the presence of the loyal mountaineer. He and his wife had been sleeping on a bed spread upon the floor before the fire drawing this to one side they heaped the chimney with green wood and were soon listening with genuine delight to the story of our adventures after breakfast next day tom with his rifle led us by a back road to the house of squire larkin c hooper a leading loyalist whom we met on the way and together we proceeded to his house ragged and forlorn we were eagerly welcomed at his home by hooper's invalid wife and daughters for several days we enjoyed a hospitality given as freely to utter strangers as if we had been relatives of the family here we learned of a party about to start through the mountains for east tennessee guided by emmanuel heden who lived on the crest of the blue ridge our friend tom was to be one of the party and other refugees were coming over the georgia border where heden better known in the settlement as man haiti was mustering his party it now being near christmas and the squire's family in daily expectation of a relative who was a captain in the confederate army it was deemed prudent for us to go on to heden's under the guidance of tom setting out at sunset on the twenty third of december it was late in the evening when we arrived at our destination having walked nine miles up the mountain trails over a light carpeting of snow pausing in front of a diminutive cabin through the chinks of whose stone fireplace and stick chimney the whole interior seemed to be red hot like a furnace our guide demanded is man heedy to hum receiving a sharp negative in reply he continued well can tom get to stay all night at this the door flew open and a skinny woman appeared her homespun frock pendant with tow-headed urchins of course you can she cried leading the way into the cabin never have i seen so unique a character as this voluble hatchet-faced tireless woman her skin was like yellow parchment, and I doubt if she knew by experience what it was to be sick or weary. She had built the stake and cap fences that divided the fields, and she boasted of the acres she had ploughed. The cabin was very small. Two bedsteads, with a narrow alleyway between, occupied half the interior. One was heaped with rubbish, and in the other slept the whole family, consisting of father, mother, a daughter of sixteen, and two little boys. When I add that the room contained a massive timber loom, a table, a spinning wheel, and a variety of rude seats, it will be understood that we were crowded uncomfortably close to the fire. Shrinking back as far as possible from the blaze, we listened in amused wonder to the tongue of this seemingly untamed virago, who nevertheless proved to be the kindest-hearted of women. She cursed, in her high-pitched tones, for a pack of fools, the men who had brought on the war. Roderick Norton, who lived down the mountain, she expressed a profane desire to stomp through the turnpike, because at some time he had stolen one of her hogs, marked as to the ear, with two smooth craps and a slit in the left. Once only she had journeyed into the low country, where she had seen those twin marvels, steam cars, and brick chimneys. On this occasion she had driven a heifer to market, making a journey of forty miles, walking beside her horse and wagon, which she took along to bring back the cornmeal received in payment for the animal charged by her husband to bring back the heifer bell and being denied that musical instrument by the purchaser it immediately assumed more importance to her mind than horse wagon and cornmeal 
baffled at first she proceeded to the pasture in the gray of the morning cornered the cow and cut off the bell and in her own picturesque language walked through the streets of wahala cussin rising at midnight she would fall to spinning with all her energy to us waked from sleep on the floor by the humming of the wheel she seemed by the light of the low fire like a witch in a sunbonnet darting forward and back we remained there several days sometimes at the cabin and sometimes at a cavern in the rocks such as abound throughout the mountains and which are called by the natives rock houses many of the men at that time were outliers that is they camped in the mountain fastnesses receiving their food from some member of the family some of these men as now had their copper stills in the rock houses while others more wary of the recruiting sergeant wandered from point to point their only furniture a rifle and a bed quilt on december twenty nine we were joined at the cavern by lieutenant knapp and captain smith federal officers who had also made their way from columbia and by three refugees from georgia whom i remember as old man teague and two vincent boys during the night our party was to start across the mountains for tennessee tom hancock was momentarily expected to join us our guide was busy with preparations for the journey the night coming on icy cold and a cutting wind driving the smoke of the fire into our granite house we abandoned it at nine o'clock and descended to the cabin eden and his wife had gone to the mill for a supply of cornmeal although it was time for their return we were in no wise alarmed by their absence and formed a jovial circle about the roaring chimney about midnight came a rap on the door thinking it was tom hancock and some of his companions i threw it open with an eager come in boys the boys began to come in stamping the snow from their boots and rattling their muskets on the floor until the house was full and yet others were on guard without and crowding the porch manheedy and his wife were already prisoners at the mill and the house had been picketed for some hours awaiting the arrival of the other refugees who had discovered the plot just in time to keep out of the toils marshalled in some semblance of military array we were marched down the mountain over the frozen ground to the house of old roderick norton the yankee officers were sent to an upper room while the refugees were guarded below under the immediate eyes of the soldiery making the best of our misfortune our original trio bounced promptly into a warm bed which had been recently deserted by some members of the family and secured a good night's rest lieutenant knapp who had imprudently indulged in frozen chestnuts on the mountainside was attacked with violent cramps and kept the household below stairs in commotion all night humanely endeavouring to assuage his agony in the morning although quite recovered he cunningly feigned a continuance of his pains and was left behind in the keeping of two guards who having no suspicion of his deep designs left their guns in the house and went out to the spring to wash knapp instantly on the alert possessed himself of the muskets and breaking the lock of one by a powerful effort he bent the barrel of the other and dashed out through the garden his keepers returning from the spring shouted and rushed indoors only to find their disabled pieces they joined our party later in the day rendering a chapfallen account of their detached service we had but a moderate march to make to the headquarters of the battalion where we were to spend the night our guards we found kindly disposed towards us but bitterly upbraiding the refugees whom they saluted by the ancient name of tories lieutenant codgel in command of the expedition privately informed us that his sympathies were entirely ours but as a matter of duty he should guard us jealously while under his military charge if we could effect our escape thereafter we had only to come to his mountain home and he would conceal us until such time as he could dispatch us with safety over the borders these mountain soldiers were mostly of two classes both opposed to the war but doing home guard duty in lieu of sterner service in the field numbers were of the outlier class who wearied of continual hiding in the laurel breaks had embraced this service as a compromise 
Many were deserters, some of whom had coolly set at defiance the terms of their furloughs, while others had abandoned the camps in Virginia and versed in mountain craft, had made their way along the Blue Ridge and put in a heroic appearance in their native valleys. That night we arrived at a farmhouse near the river, where we found Major Parker commanding the battalion, with a small detachment billeted upon the family. The farmer was a gray-haired old loyalist, whom I shall always remember leaning on his staff in the middle of the kitchen, barred out from his place in the chimney corner by the noisy circle of his unbidden guests. Major Parker was a brisk little man, clad in brindled jeans of ancient cut, resplendent with brass buttons. Two small piercing eyes, deep-set beside a hawk's beak nose, twinkled from under the rim of his brown straw hat, whose crown was defiantly surmounted by a cock's feather. But he was exceedingly jolly withal, and welcomed the Yankees with pompous good humor, dispatching a sergeant for a jug of applejack, which was doubtless as inexpensive to the major as his other hospitality. Having been a prisoner at Chicago, he prided himself on its knowledge of dungeon etiquette and the military courtesies due to our rank. We were awakened in the morning by high-pitched voices in the room below. Lieutenant Sill and I passed the night in neighboring caverns of the same miraculous feather bed. We recognized the voice of the major, informing some culprit that he had just ten minutes to live, and that if he wished to send any dying message to his wife or children, then and there was his last opportunity and then followed the tramping of the guards as they retired from his presence with their victim. Hastily dressing, we hurried down to find what was the matter. We were welcomed with a cheery good morning from the major, who seemed to be in the sunniest of spirits. No sign of commotion was visible. "'Step out to the branch, gentlemen. Your parole of honor is sufficient. You'll find towels. Been a prisoner myself.' And he restrained by a sign the sentinel who would have accompanied us. At the branch in the yard we found the other refugees trembling for their fate, and learned that Haddon had gone to the orchard in the charge of a file of soldiers with a rope. While we were discussing the situation and endeavoring to calm the apprehensions of the Georgians, the executioners returned from the orchard, our guide marching in advance and looking none the worse for the rough handling he had undergone. The brave fellow had confided his last message, and been thrice drawn up toward the branch of an apple tree, and as many times lowered for the information it was supposed he would give. Nothing was learned, and it is probable he had no secrets to disclose or conceal. Lieutenant Codgell, with two soldiers, was detailed to conduct us to Qualatown, a Cherokee station at the foot of the Great Smoky Mountains. Two horses were allotted to the guard, and we set out in military order, the refugees two and two in advance, Eden and old man Teague lashed together by the wrists, and the rear brought up by the troopers on horseback. It was the last day of the year, and although a winter morning, the rare mountain air was as soft as spring. We struck the banks of the Tuxigi, directly opposite to a feathery waterfall, which, leaping over a crag of the opposite cliff, was dissipated in a glittering sheet of spray before reaching the tops of the trees below. As the morning advanced, we fell into a more negligent order of marching. The beautiful river, a wide, swift current flowing smoothly between thickly wooded banks, swept by on our left, and on the right, wild, uninhabited mountains closed in the road. The two Vincents were strolling along far in advance. Some distance behind them were Heden and Teague. The remainder of us followed in a general group, Sill mounted beside one of the guards. Advancing in this order, a cry from the front broke on the stillness of the woods, and we beheld old man Teague gesticulating wildly in the center of the road and screaming, He's gone! He's gone! Catch him! Sure enough, the old man was alone the fragment of the parted strap dangling from his outstretched wrist. The guard, who was mounted, dashed off in pursuit, followed by the lieutenant on foot, but both soon returned, giving over the hopeless chase. Thoroughly frightened by the events of the morning, Eden had watched his opportunity to make good his escape, 
and as we afterward learned joined by knapp and tom hancock he conducted a party safely to tennessee at webster the court town of jackson county we were quartered for the night in the jail but accompanied lieutenant codgill to a venison breakfast at the parsonage with mrs harris and her daughter who had called on us the evening before snow had fallen during the night and when we continued our march it was with the half-frozen slush crushing in and out at every step through our broken shoes before the close of this dreary new year's day we came upon the scene of one of those wild tragedies which are still of too frequent occurrence in those remote regions isolated from the strong arm of the law our road led down and around the mountain side which on our right was a barren rocky waste sloping gradually up from the inner curve of the arc we were describing from this direction arose a low wailing sound and a little farther on we came in view of a dismal group of men women and mules in the centre of the gathering lay the lifeless remains of a father and his two sons seated upon the ground swaying and weeping over their dead were the mother and wives of the young men a burial party armed with spades and picks waited by their mules while at a respectful distance from the mourners stood a circle of neighbors and passers-by some gazing in silent sympathy and others not hesitating to express a quiet approval of the shocking tragedy between two families the hoopers and the watsons a bitter feud had long existed and from time to time men of each clan had fallen by the rifles of the others the hoopers were loyal union men and if the watsons yielded any loyalty it was to the state of north carolina on one occasion shortly before the final tragedy when one of the young hoopers was sitting quietly in his door a light puff of smoke rose from the bushes and a rifle ball ploughed through his leg the hoopers resolved to begin the new year by wiping out their enemies root and branch before light they had surrounded the log cabin of the watsons and secured all the male inmates except one who wounded escaped through a window the latter afterward executed a singular revenge by killing and skinning the dog of his enemies and elevating the carcass on a pole in front of their house after a brief stay at Qualatown, we set out for Asheville, leaving behind our old and friendly guard besides the soldiers who now had us in charge a cherokee indian was allotted to each prisoner with instructions to keep his man constantly in view to travel with an armed indian sullen and silent trotting at your heels like a dog with very explicit instructions to blow out your brains at the first attempt to escape is neither cheerful nor ornamental and we were a sorry-looking party plodding silently along the road detachments of prisoners were frequently passed over this route and regular stopping places were established for the nights it was growing dusk when we arrived at the first cantonment which was the wing of a great barren farmhouse owned by colonel bryson the place was already occupied by a party of refugees and we were directed to a barn in the field beyond we had brought with us uncooked rations and while two of the soldiers went into the house for cooking utensils the rest of the party including the indians were leaning in a line upon the dooryard fence sill and lamson were at the end of the line where the fence cornered with a hedge presently the two soldiers reappeared one of them with an iron pot in which to cook our meat and the other swinging in his hand a burning brand in the wake of these guides we followed down to the barn and had already started a fire when word came from the house that for fear of rain we had best return to the corn barn it was not until we were again in the road that i noticed the absence of sill and lamson i hastened to smith and confided the good news the fugitives were missed almost simultaneously by the guards who first beat up the vicinity of the barn and then after securing the remainder of us in a corn crib sent out the indians in pursuit faithful dogs as these cherokees had shown themselves during the day they proved but poor hunters when the game was in the bush and soon returned giving over the chase 
half an hour later they were all back in camp baking their hoe cake in genuine aboriginal fashion flattened on the surface of a board and inclined to the heat of the fire footnote sill and lamson reached loudon tennessee in february a few days after their escape from the indian guard they arrived at the house of shooting john brown who confided them to the care of the young hoopers and a party of their outlying companions from a rocky cliff overlooking the valley of the Tassigi, they could look down on the river roads dotted with the sheriff's posse in pursuit of the hoopers so near were they that they could distinguish a relative of the watsons leading the sheriff's party one of the hooper boys with characteristic recklessness and to the consternation of the others stood boldly out on a great rock in plain sight of his pursuers if they had chanced to look up half resolved to try his rifle at the last of the watsons End note. that i was eager to follow goes without saying but our keepers had learned our slippery character all the way to asheville a day and night we were watched with sleepless vigilance there we gave our parole smith and i and secured thereby comfortable quarters in the courthouse with freedom to stroll about the town old man teague and the vincents were committed to the county jail we were there a week part of my spare time being employed in helping a confederate army officer make out a correct payroll when our diminished ranks had been recruited by four more officers from columbia who had been captured near the frozen summit of the great smoky mountains we were started on a journey of sixty miles to greenville in south carolina the night before our arrival we were quartered at a large farmhouse the prisoners together with the privates of the guard were allotted a comfortable room which contained however but a single bed the officer in charge had retired to enjoy the hospitality of the family a flock of enormous white pullets were roosting in the yard procuring an iron kettle from the servants who looked with grinning approval upon all forms of chicken stealing we sallied forth to the capture twisting the precious necks of half a dozen we left them to die in the grass while we pierced the side of a sweet potato mound loaded with our booty we retreated to the house undiscovered and spent the night in cooking in one pot instead of sleeping in one bed the fowls were skinned instead of plucked and vandals that we were dressed on the backs of the picture frames taken down from the walls at greenville we were lodged in the county jail to await the reconstruction of railway bridges when we were to be transported to columbia the jail was a stone structure two stories in height with halls through the center on both floors and square rooms on each side the lock was turned on our little party of six in one of these upper rooms having two grated windows looking down on the walk through the door which opened on the hall a square hole was cut as high as one's face and large enough to admit the passage of a plate aside from the rigor of our confinement we were treated with marked kindness we had scarcely walked about our dungeon before the jailer's daughters were at the door with their autograph albums in a few days we were playing draughts and reading bulwer while the girls without were preparing our food and knitting for us warm new stockings notwithstanding all these attentions we were ungratefully discontented at the end of the first week we were joined by seven enlisted men ohio boys who like ourselves had been found at large in the mountains from one of these new arrivals we procured a case knife and a gun screwdriver down on the hearth before the fire the screwdriver was placed on the thick edge of the knife and belabored with a beef bone until a few inches of its back were converted into a rude saw the grate in the window was formed of cast iron bars passing perpendicularly through wrought iron plates bedded in the stone jams if one of these perpendicular bars an inch and a half square could be cut through the plates might be easily bent so as to permit the egress of a man with this end in view we cautiously began operations outside of the bars a piece of carpet had been stretched to keep out the raw wind and behind this we worked with safety an hour's toil produced but a few feathery filings on the horizontal plate but many hands make light work and steadily the cut grew deeper 
we recalled the adventures of claude duval dick turpin and sixteen string jack and saw it away during the available hours of three days and throughout one entire night the blade of steel was worrying rasping eating the iron bar at last the grocer yielded to the temper and persistence of the finer metal it was saturday night when the toilsome cut was completed and preparations were already under way for a speedy departure the jail had always been regarded as too secure to require a military guard although soldiers were quartered in the town besides the night was so cold that a crust had formed on the snow and both citizens and soldiers unused to such extreme weather would be likely to remain indoors for greater secrecy of movement we divided into small parties aiming to traverse different roads i was to go with my former companion captain smith lots were cast to determine the order of our going first exit was allotted to four of the ohio soldiers made fast to the grating outside were a bit of rope and a strip of blanket along which to descend our room was immediately over that of the jailer and his sleeping family and beneath our opening was a window which each man must pass in his descent at eleven o'clock the exodus began the first man was passed through the bars amid a suppressed buzz of whispered cautions his boots were handed after him in a haversack the rest of us pressing our faces to the frosty grating listened breathlessly for the success of the movement we could no longer see suddenly there was a crash and in the midst of mutterings of anger we snatched at the rag ladder and restored the piece of carpeting to its place outside the bars our pioneer had hurt his hand against the rough stones and floundering in mid-air had dashed his leg through sash and glass of the window below we could see nothing of his further movements but soon discovered the jailer standing in the door looking up and down the street seemingly in the dark as to where the crash came from at last wearied and worried and disappointed we lay down in our blankets upon the hard floor End of section 14. Section 15 of Famous Adventures and Prison Escapes of the Civil War by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 15. A Hard Road to Travel Out of Dixie. Part 3. At daylight we were awakened by the voice of Miss Emma at the hole in the door. Who got out last night? well t well you was fools you didn't all go pap wouldn't a stopped you if you'll keep the break concealed until tonight we'll let you all out the secret of the extreme kindness of our keepers was explained the jailer a loyalist retained his position as a civil detail thus protecting himself and sons from conscription welty had been taken in the night before his bruises had been anointed and he had been provisioned for the journey we spent the day repairing our clothing and preparing for the road my long-heeled cowhides wife's shoes for which i had exchanged a uniform waistcoat with a cotton-wooled old darkey on the banks of the saluda were about parting soles from uppers and i kept the twain together by winding my feet with stout cords at supper an extra ration was given us as soon as it was dark the old jailer appeared among us and gave us a minute description of the different roads leading west into the mountains warning us of certain dangers at eleven o'clock miss emma came with the great keys and we followed her in single file down the stairs and out into the back yard of the jail from the broken gratings in front the bit of rope and strip of blanket were left dangling in the wind we made short work of leave-taking captain smith and i separating immediately from the rest and pushing hurriedly out of the sleeping town by back streets into the bitter cold of the country roads we stopped once to warm at the pits of some negro charcoal burners and before day dawned had travelled sixteen miles we found a sheltered nook on the side of the mountain open to the sun where we made a bed of dry leaves and remained for the day at night we set out again due west by the stars but before we had gone far my companion who claimed to know something of the country insisted upon going to the left and within a mile turned into another left-hand road 
i protested claiming that this course was leading us back while we were yet contending we came to a bridgeless creek whose dark waters barred our progress and at the same moment as if induced by the thought of the fording the captain was seized with rheumatic pains in his knees so that he walked with difficulty we had just passed a house where lights were still showing and to this we decided to return hoping at least to find shelter for smith leaving him at the gate i went to a side porch and knocked at the door which was opened by a woman who proved to be friendly to our cause her husband being in the rebel army much against his will we were soon seated to the right and left of her fireplace blazing pine knots brilliantly lighted the room and a number of beds lined the walls a trundle bed before the fire was occupied by a very old woman who was feebly moaning with rheumatism our hostess shouted into the old lady's ear granny dem's yankees be day said she peering at us with her poor old eyes be ye sellin tablecloths when it was explained that we were just from the war she demanded in an absent way to know if we were britishers we slept in one of the comfortable beds and as a measure of prudence passed the day in the woods leaving at nightfall with well-filled haversacks captain smith was again the victim of his rheumatism and directing me to his friends at caesar's head where i was to wait for him until monday it then being tuesday he returned to the house little thinking that we were separating forever i travelled very rapidly all night hoping to make the whole distance but day was breaking when i reached the headwaters of the saluda following up the stream i found a dam on which i crossed and although the sun was rising and the voices of children mingled with the lowing of cattle in the frosty air i ran across the fields and gained a secure hiding-place on the side of the mountain it was a long solitary day and glad was i when it grew sufficiently dark to turn the little settlement and get into the main road up the mountain it was six zigzag miles to the top the road turning on log abutments well anchored with stones and not a habitation on the way until i should reach bishop's house on the crest of the divide halfway up i paused before a big summer hotel looming up in the woods like the ghost of a deserted factory its broken windows and rotting gateways redoubling the solitude of the bleak mountainside shortly before reaching bishop's wife's shoes became quite unmanageable one had climbed up my leg halfway to the knee and i knocked at the door with the wreck of the other in my hand my visit had been preceded but a day by a squad of partisan raiders who had carried away the bedding and driven off the cattle of my new friends and for this reason the most generous hospitality could offer no better couch than the hard floor stretched thereon in close proximity to the dying fire the cold air coming up through the wide cracks between the hewn planks seemed to be cutting me in sections as with icy saws so that i was forced to establish myself lengthways on a broad puncheon at the side of the room and under the table in this family the grey mare was the better horse and poor bishop an inoffensive man and a cripple withal was wedded to a regular xantope it was evident that unpleasant thoughts were dominant in the woman's mind as she proceeded sullenly and vigorously with preparations for breakfast the bitter bread of charity was being prepared with a vengeance for the unwelcome guest premonitions of the coming storm flashed now and then in lightning cuffs at the ears of the children or crashed venomously among the pottery in the fireplace at last the repast was spread the table still standing against the wall as is the custom among mountain housewives the good-natured husband now advanced cheerfully to lend a hand in removing it into the middle of the room it was when one of the table legs overturned the swill pail that the long pent-up storm burst in a torrent of invective the prospect of spending several days here was a very gloomy outlook and the relief was great when it was proposed to pay a visit to neighbor case whose house was in the nearest valley and with whose sons captain smith had lain in concealment for some weeks on a former visit to the mountains i was curious to see his sons who were famous outliers 
from safe cover they delighted to pick off a recruiting officer or a tax-in-kind collector or tumble out of their saddles the last drivers of a wagon train these lively young men had been in unusual demand of late and their hiding place was not known even to the faithful so i was condemned to the society of an outlier of a less picturesque variety pink bishop was a blacksmith and just the man to forge me a set of shoes from the leather neighbor's case had already provided the little still shed concealed from the road only by a low hill was considered an unsafe harbor on account of a fresh fall of snow with its sensibility to tell-tale impressions so we set up our shoe factory in a deserted cabin well back on the mountain and just astride of that imaginary line which divides the carolinas from the fireplace we dug away the corn stalks heaping the displaced bundles against broken windows and windy cracks and otherwise secured our retreat against frost and enemies then ensued three days of primitive shoemaking as may be inferred the shoes made no pretensions to style i sewed the short seams at the sides and split the pegs from a section of seasoned maple rudely constructed as these shoes were they bore their wearer triumphantly into the promised land i restrained my eagerness to be going until monday night the time agreed upon when my disabled companion not putting in an appearance i set out for my old friends in cashers valley i got safely over a long wooden bridge within half a mile of a garrisoned town i left the road and turned as i believed away from the town but i was absolutely lost in the darkness of a snowstorm and forced to seek counsel as well as shelter in this plight i pressed on toward a light glimmering faintly through the blinding snow it led me into the shelter of the porch to a small brown house cut deeply beneath the low eaves and protected at the sides by flanking bedrooms my knock was answered by a girlish voice and from the ensuing parley through the closed door i learned that she was the daughter of a baptist exhorter and that she was alone in the house her brother being away at the village and her father who preached the day before at some distance not being expected home until the next morning reassured by my civil-toned inquiries about the road she unfastened the door and came out to the porch where she proceeded to instruct me how to go on which was just the thing i least desired to do by this time i had discovered the political complexion of the family and making myself known was instantly invited in with the assurance that her father would be gravely displeased if she permitted me to go on before he returned i had interrupted my little benefactress in the act of writing a letter on a sheet of fool's cap which lay on an old-fashioned stand in one corner of the room beside the ink bottle and the candlestick in the diagonal corner stood a tall bookcase the crowded volumes nestling lovingly behind the glass doors the only collection of the sort that i saw at any time in the mountains a feather bed was spread upon the floor the head raised by means of a turned-down chair and here i was reposing comfortably when the brother arrived it was late in the forenoon when the minister reached home his rickety wagon creaking through the snow and drawn at a snail's pace by a long-furred knock-kneed horse the tall but not very clerical figure was wrapped in a shawl and swathed round the throat with many turns of a woolen tippet the daughter ran out with eagerness to greet her father and tell of the wonderful arrival i was received with genuine delight it was the enthusiasm of a patriot eager to find a sympathetic ear for his long repressed views footnote the rev james h duckworth now postmaster of brevard transylvania county north carolina and in eighteen sixty eight member of the state constitutional convention in his letter of june twenty four eighteen ninety says i have not forgotten those things of which you speak i can almost see you even in imagination standing at the fire when i drove up to the gate and went into the house and asked you have i ever seen you before just then i observed your uniform oh yes said i i know who it is now this daughter of whom you speak married about a year after and is living in morgantown north carolina about one hundred miles from here 
Hattie, for that is her name, is a pious religious woman. End note. When night came and no entreaties could prevail to detain me over another day, the minister conducted me some distance in person, passing me on with ample directions to another exhorter, who was located for that night at the house of a miller who kept a ferocious dog. I came first to the pond and then to the mill and got into the house without encountering the dog. Aware of the necessity of arriving before bedtime, I had made such speed as to find the miller's family still lingering about the fireplace with preacher number two seated in the lay circle. That night I slept with the parson, who sat up in bed in the morning and after disencumbering himself of a striped extinguisher nightcap, electrified the other sleepers by announcing that this was the first time he had ever slept with a Yankee. After breakfast, the parson, armed with staff and scrip, signified his purpose to walk with me during the day, as it was no longer dangerous to move by daylight. We must have been traveling the regular Baptist road, for we lodged that night at the house of another lay brother. The minister continued with me a few miles in the morning, intending to put me in the company of a man who was going toward Cashier's Valley in a hunting expedition. When we reached his house, however, the hunter had gone, so after parting with my guide I set forward through the woods, following the tracks of the hunter's horse. The shoe prints were sometimes plainly impressed in the snow, and again for long distances over dry leaves and bare ground, but an occasional trace could be found. It was past noon when I arrived at the house where the hunters were assembled. Quite a number of men were gathered in and about the porch, just returned from the chase. Blinded by the snow over which I had been walking in the glare of the sun, I blundered up the steps, inquiring without much tact for the rider who had preceded me, and was no little alarmed at receiving a rude and gruff reception. I continued in suspense for some time, until my man found an opportunity to inform me that there were suspicious persons present, thus accounting for his unexpected manner. The explanation was made at a combination meal, serving for both dinner and supper, and consisting exclusively of beans. I set out at twilight to make a walk of thirteen miles to the house of our old friend Esquire Hooper. Eager for the cordial welcome which I knew awaited me, and nerved by the frosty air, I sped over the level wood road, much of the way running instead of walking. Three times I came upon bends of the same broad rivulet. Taking off my shoes and stockings and rolling up my trousers above my knees, I tried the first passage. Flakes of broken ice were eddying against the banks, and before gaining the middle of the stream, my feet and ankles ached with the cold, the sharp pain increasing at every step until I threw my blanket on the opposite bank and, springing upon it, wrapped my feet in its dry folds. Rising a little knoll, soon after making the third ford, I came suddenly upon the familiar stopping place of my former journey. It was scarcely more than nine o'clock, and the little hardships of the journey from Caesar's head seemed but a cheap outlay for the joy of the meeting with friends so interested in the varied fortunes of myself and my late companions. Together we rejoiced at the escape of Sill and Lamson, and made merry over the vicissitudes of my checkered career. Here I first learned of the safe arrival in Tennessee of Knapp, Man Hetty, and old Tom Hancock. After a day's rest, I climbed the mountains to the Hayden cabin, now presided over by the heroine of the heifer bell, in the absence of her fugitive husband. Saddling her horse, she took me the next evening to join a lad who was about starting for Shooting Creek. Young Green was awaiting my arrival, and after a brief delay, we were off on a journey of something like sixty miles. The journey, however, was pushed to a successful termination by the help of information gleaned by the way. It was at the close of the last night's march, which had been long and uneventful, except that we had surmounted no fewer than three snow-capped ridges, that my blacksmith's shoes, soaked to a pulp by the wet snow, gave out altogether. 
on the top of the last ridge i found myself panting in the yellow light of the rising sun the sad wrecks of my two shoes dangling from my hands a wilderness of beauty spread out before me and a sparkling field of frosty forms beneath my tingling feet stretching far into the west toward the open country of east tennessee was the limitless wilderness of mountains drawn like mighty furrows across the toilsome way the pale blue of the uttermost ridges fading into an imperceptible union with the sky a log house was in sight down in the valley a perpendicular column of smoke rising from its single chimney toward this we picked our way i in my stocking feet and my boy guide confidently predicting that we should find the required cobbler of course we found him in a country where every family makes its own shoes as much as its own bread and he was ready to serve the traveller without pay notwithstanding our night's work we tarried only for the necessary repairs and just before sunset we looked down upon the scattering settlement of shooting creek standing on the bleak brow of chunky gall mountain my guide recognized the first familiar object on the trip which was the roof of his uncle's house at shooting creek i was the guest of the widow kitchen whose house was the chief one in the settlement and whose estate boasted two slaves the husband had fallen by an anonymous bullet while salting his cattle on the mountain in an early year of the war on the day following my arrival i was conducted over a ridge to another creek where i met two professional guides quince edmonston and mac hooper as i came upon the pair parting a thicket of laurel with their long rifles at a shoulder i instantly recognized the coat of the latter as the snuff-coloured sack in which i had last seen lieutenant lamson it had been given to the man at chattanooga where these same guides had conducted my former companions in safety a month before quince edmonston the elder had led numerous parties of yankee officers over the wachisi trail for a consideration of a hundred dollars pledged to be paid by each officer at chattanooga or nashville two other officers were concealed nearby and a number of refugees awaiting a convoy and an arrangement was rapidly made with the guides the swollen condition of the valley river made it necessary to remain for several days at shooting creek before setting out mac and i were staying at the house of mrs kitchen it was on the afternoon of a memorable friday the rain still falling in torrents without that i sat before the fire poring over a small sunday school book the only printed book in the house if not in the settlement mac hooper was sitting by the door attracted by a rustling sound in his direction i looked up just in time to see his heels disappearing under the nearest bed leaping to my feet with an instinctive impulse to do likewise i was confronted in the doorway by a stalwart confederate officer fully uniformed and armed behind him was his quartermaster sergeant this was a government party collecting the tax in kind which at that time throughout the confederacy was the tenth part of all crops and other farm productions it was an ugly surprise seeing no escape i ventured a remark on the weather only a stare in reply a plan of escape flashed through my mind like an inspiration i seated myself quietly and for an instant bent my eyes upon the printed pages the two soldiers had advanced to the corner of the chimney nearest the door inquiring for the head of the family and keeping their eyes riveted on my hostile uniform at this juncture i was seized with a severe fit of coughing with one hand upon my chest i walked slowly past the men and laid my carefully opened book face down upon a chest with another step or two i was in the porch and bounding into the kitchen i sprang out through a window already opened by the woman for my exit away i sped bareheaded through the pelting rain now crashing through thick underbrush now up to my waist in swollen streams plunging on and on only mindful to select a course that would baffle horsemen in pursuit 
after some miles of running i took cover behind a stack within view of the road which mac must take in retreating to the other settlement and sure enough here he was coming down the road with my cap and haversack which was already loaded for the western journey mac had remained undiscovered under the bed an interested listener to the conversation that ensued the officer had been assured that i was a friendly scout but convinced of the contrary by my flight he had departed swearing he would capture that yankee before morning if he had to search the whole settlement so alarmed were we for our safety that we crossed that night into a third valley and slept in the loft of a horse barn on sunday our expedition assembled on a hillside overlooking shooting creek where our friends in the secret of the movement came up to bid us adieu with guides we were a party of thirteen or fourteen but only three of us officers who were to pay for our safe conduct each man carried his supply of bread and meat and bedding some were wrapped in faded bed quilts and some in tattered army blankets nearly all wore ragged clothes broken shoes and had unkempt beards we arrived upon a mountain side overlooking the settlement of peach tree and were awaiting the friendly shades of night under which to descend to the house of the man who was to put us across valley river premature darkness was accompanied with torrents of rain through which we followed our new uncertain guides at last the light of the cabin we were seeking gleamed humidly through the trees most of the family fled into the outhouses at our approach some of them not reappearing until we were disposed for sleep in a half circle before the fire the last arrivals were two tall women in homespun dresses and calico sunbonnets they slid timidly in at the door with averted faces and then with a rush and a bounce covered themselves out of sight in a bed where they had probably been sleeping in the same clothing when we approached the house here we learned that a cavalcade of four hundred texan rangers had advanced into tennessee by the roads on the day before our guides familiar with the movements of these dreaded troopers calculated that with the day's delay enforced by the state of the river a blow would have been struck and the marauders would be in full retreat before we should arrive on the ground we passed that day concealed in a stable and as soon as it was sufficiently dark we proceeded in a body to the bank of the river attended by a man and a horse the stream was narrow but the current was full and swift the horse breasted the flood with difficulty but he bore us all across one at a time seated behind the farmer we had now left behind us the last settlement and before us lay only wild and uninhabited mountains the trail we travelled was an indian path extending for nearly seventy miles through an uninhabited wilderness instead of crossing the ridges it follows the trend of the range winding for the most part along the crests of the divides the occasional traveller having once mounted to its level pursues his solitary way with little climbing early in the morning of the fourth day our little party was assembled upon the last mountain overlooking the open country of east tennessee some of us had been wandering in the mountains for the whole winter we were returning to a half-forgotten world of farms and fences roads and railways below us stretched the Teleco river away toward the line of towns marking the course of the nashville and chattanooga railroad one of the guides who had ventured down to the nearest house returned with information that the four hundred texan rangers had burned the depot at philadelphia station the day before but were now thought to be out of the country we could see the distant smoke arising from the ruins where the river flowed out of the mountains were extensive ironworks the property of a loyal citizen and in front of his house we halted for consultation he regretted that we had shown ourselves so soon as the rear guard of the marauders had passed the night within sight of where we now stood our nearest pickets were at loudon thirty miles distant on the railway and for this station we were advised to make all speed for half a mile the road ran along the bank of the river and then turned around a wooded bluff to the right opposite this bluff and accessible by a shallow ford was another hill where it was feared that some of the rangers were still lingering about their camp 
as we came to the turn in the road our company was walking rapidly in indian file guide edmonston and i at the front coming around the bluff from the opposite direction was a countryman mounted on a powerful gray mare his overcoat was army blue but he wore a bristling fur cap and his rifle was slung on his back at sight of us he turned in his saddle to shout to someone behind and bringing his gun to bear came tearing and swearing down the road spattering the gravel under the big hoofs of the gray close at his heels rode two officers in confederate gray uniforms and a motley crowd of riders closed up the road behind in an instant the guide and i were surrounded the whole cavalcade leveling their guns at the thicket and calling on our companions who could be plainly heard crashing through the bushes to halt the dress of but few of our captors could be seen nearly all being covered with rubber talmas but their mounts including mules as well as horses were equipped with every variety of bridle and saddle to be imagined i knew at a glance that this was no body of our cavalry if we were in the hands of the rangers the fate of the guides and refugees would be the hardest i thought they might spare the lives of the officers who are you what are you doing here demanded the commander riding up to us and scrutinizing our rags i hesitated a moment and then throwing off the blanket i wore over my shoulders simply said you can see what i am my rags were the rags of a uniform and spoke for themselves our captors proved to be a company of the second ohio heavy artillery in pursuit of the marauders into whose clutches we thought we had fallen the farmer on the gray mare was the guide of the expedition and the two men uniformed as rebel officers were union scouts the irregular equipment of the animals which had excited my suspicion most as well as the animals themselves had been hastily impressed from the country about the village of loudon where the second ohio was stationed on the following evening which was the fourth of march the day of the second inauguration of president lincoln we walked into loudon and gladly surrendered ourselves to the outposts of the ohio heavy artillery End of section 15section 16 of famous adventures and the prison escapes of the civil war by various this librivox recording is in the public domain section 16 escape of general breckinridge by john taylor wood part one as one of the aides of president jefferson davis i left richmond with him and his cabinet on april second eighteen sixty five the night of evacuation and accompanied him through virginia the carolinas and georgia until his capture except lieutenant barnwell i was the only one of the party who escaped after our surprise i was guarded by a trooper a german who had appropriated my horse and most of my belongings i determined if possible to escape but after witnessing mr davis's unsuccessful attempt i was doubtful of success however i consulted him and he advised me to try taking my guard aside i asked him by signs for he could speak little or no english to accompany me outside the picket line to the swamp showing him at the same time a twenty dollar gold piece he took it tried the weight of it in his hands and put it between his teeth fully satisfied that it was not spurious he escorted me with his carbine to the stream the banks of which were lined with a few straggling alder bushes and thick saw grass i motioned him to return to camp only a few rods distant he shook his head saying nine nine i gave him another twenty dollar gold piece he chinked them together and held up two fingers i turned my pockets inside out and then satisfied that i had no more he left me creeping a little farther into the swamp i lay concealed for about three hours in the most painful position sometimes moving a few yards almost ventre a terre to escape notice for i was within hearing of the camps on each side of the stream and often when the soldiers came down for water or to water their horses i was within a few yards of them 
some two hours or more passed thus before the party moved the wagons left first then the bugle sounded and the president started out on one of his carriage horses followed by his staff and a squadron of the enemy shortly after their departure i saw someone leading two abandoned horses into the swamp and recognized lieutenant barnwell of our escort secreting the horses we picked up from the debris of the camp parts of two saddles and bridles and with some patching and tying fitted out our horses as sad and war-worn animals as ever man bestrode though weary and tired we gave the remains of the camp provisions to a mr finn for dinner he recommended us to widow polk's a few miles distant an old lady rich in cattle alone the day after my escape i met judah p benjamin as m bonfals a french gentleman travelling for information in a light wagon with colonel levy who acted as interpreter with goggles on his beard grown a hat well over his face and a large cloak hiding his figure no one would have recognized him as the late secretary of state of the confederacy i told him of the capture of mr davis and his party and made an engagement to meet him near madison florida and there decide upon our future movements he was anxious to push on and left us to follow more leisurely passing as paroled soldiers returning home for the next three days we travelled as fast as our poor horses would permit leading or driving them for even if they had been strong enough their backs were in such a condition that we could not ride we held on to them simply in the hope that we might be able to dispose of them or exchange them to advantage but we finally were forced to abandon one on the thirteenth we passed through valdosta the first place since leaving washington in upper georgia in which we were able to purchase anything here i secured two hickory shirts and a pair of socks a most welcome addition to my outfit for except what i stood in i had left all my baggage behind near valdosta we found mr osborne barnwell an uncle of my young friend a refugee from the coast of south carolina where he had lost a beautiful estate surrounded with all the comforts and elegances which wealth and a refined taste could offer here in the pine forests as far as possible from the paths of war and almost outside of civilization he had brought his family of ladies and children and with the aid of his servants most of whom had followed him had built with a few tools a rough log cabin with six or eight rooms but without nails screws bolts or glass almost as primitive a building as robinson crusoe's but in spite of all drawbacks the ingenuity and deft hands of the ladies had given to the premises an air of comfort and refinement that was most refreshing here i rested two days enjoying the company of this charming family with whom lieutenant barnwell remained on the fifteenth i crossed into florida and rode to general finnegan's near madison here i met general breckinridge the late secretary of war of the confederacy alias colonel cabell and his aide colonel wilson a pleasant encounter for both parties mr benjamin had been in the neighborhood but hearing that the enemy were in madison had gone off at a tangent we were fully posted as to the different routes to the seaboard by general finnegan and discussed with him the most feasible way of leaving the country i inclined to the eastern coast and this was decided on i exchanged my remaining horse with general finnegan for a better giving him fifty dollars to boot leaving madison we crossed the sewanee river at moody's ferry and took the old st augustine road but seldom travelled in late years as it leads through a pine wilderness and there is one stretch of twenty miles with only water of bad quality at the diablo sinks i rode out of my way some fifteen miles to mr ulys formerly senator of the united states and afterward confederate senator hoping to meet mr benjamin but he was too wily to be found at the house of a friend mr ulys was absent on my arrival but mrs ulys a charming lady and one of the noted family of beautiful women welcomed me heartily mr ulys returned during the night from jacksonville and gave me the first news of what was going on in the world that i had had for nearly a month including the information that mr davis and party had reached hilton head on their way north 
another day's ride brought us to the house of the brothers william and samuel owens two wealthy and hospitable gentlemen near orange lake here i rejoined general breckinridge and we were advised to secure the services and experience of captain dickinson we sent to waldo for him and a most valuable friend he proved during the war he had rendered notable services among others he had surprised and captured the united states gunboat columbine on the st john's river one of whose small boats he had retained and kept concealed near the banks of the river this boat with two of his best men he now put at our disposal with orders to meet us on the upper st john we now passed through a much more interesting country than the two or three hundred miles of pines we had just traversed it was better watered the forests were more diversified with varied species occasionally thickets or hummocks were met with and later these gave place to swamps and everglades with a tropical vegetation the road led by silver spring the clear and crystal waters of which show at the depth of hundreds of feet almost as distinctly as though seen through air we travelled incognito known only to good friends who sent us stage by stage from one to another and by all we were welcomed most kindly besides those mentioned i recall with gratitude the names of judge dawkins mr mann colonel summers major stork all of whom overwhelmed us with kindness offering us of everything they had of money they were as bare as ourselves for confederate currency had disappeared as suddenly as snow before a warm sun and greenbacks were as yet unknown before leaving our friends we laid in a three weeks supply of stores for we could not depend upon obtaining any further south on may twenty five we struck the st john's river at fort butler opposite volusia where we met russell and o'toole two of dickinson's command in charge of the boat and two most valuable and trustworthy comrades they proved to be either in camp or in the boat as hunters or fishermen the boat was a man-of-war's small four-oared gig our outfit was scanty but what was necessary we rapidly improvised here general breckinridge and i gave our horses to our companions and thus ended my long ride of a thousand miles from virginia stowing our supplies away we bade good-bye to our friends and started up the river with a fair wind our party consisted of general breckinridge his aide colonel wilson of kentucky the general servant tom who had been with him all through the war besides russell o'toole and i six in all with our stores arms etc it was a tight fit to get into the boat there was no room to lie down or to stretch at night we landed and like old campaigners were soon comfortable but at midnight the rain came down in bucketfuls and continued till nearly morning and notwithstanding every effort a large portion of our supplies were soaked and rendered worthless and what was worse some of our powder shared the same fate morning broke on a thoroughly drenched and unhappy company but a little rum and water with a corn dodger and the rising sun soon stirred us and with a fair wind we made a good day's run some thirty-five miles except the ruins of two huts there was no sign that a human being had ever visited these waters for the war and the occasional visit of a gunboat had driven off the few settlers the river gradually became narrower and more tortuous as we approached its headwaters the banks were generally low with a few sandy elevations thickly wooded or swampy occasionally we passed a small opening or savanna on which were sometimes feeding a herd of wild cattle and deer at the latter we had several pot shots all wide alligators as immovable as the logs on which they rested could be counted by hundreds and of all sizes up to twelve or fifteen feet occasionally as we passed uncomfortably near we could not resist even with our scant supply of ammunition giving them a little cold lead between the head and shoulders the only vulnerable place with a fair wind we sailed the twelve miles across lake monroe a pretty sheet of water the deserted huts of enterprise and mellonville on each side above the lake the river became still narrower and more tortuous dividing sometimes into numerous branches most of which proved to be mere cul-de-sacs 
the long moss reaching from the overhanging branches to the water gave to the surroundings a most weird and funereal aspect on may twenty nine we reached lake harney whence we determined to make the portage to indian river o'toole was sent to look for some means of moving our boat he returned next day with two small black bulls yoked to a pair of wheels such are used by lumbermen their owner was a compound of caucasian african and indian with the shrewdness of the white the good temper of the negro and the indolence of the red man he was at first exorbitant in his demands but a little money some tobacco and a spare fowling piece made him happy and he was ready to let us drive his beast to the end of the peninsula it required some skill to mount the boat securely on the wheels and to guard against any upsets or collisions for our escape depended upon carrying it safely across the next morning we made an early start our course was an easterly one through a roadless flat sandy pine barren with an occasional thicket and swamp from the word go trouble with the bulls began their owner seemed to think that in furnishing them he had fulfilled his part of the contract they would neither gee nor haw if one started ahead the other would go astern if by accident they started ahead together they would certainly bring up with their heads on each side of a tree occasionally they would lie down in a pool to get rid of the flies and only by the most vigorous prodding could they be induced to move paul the owner would loiter in the rear but was always on hand when we halted for meals finally we told him no work no grub no drive bulls no tobacco this roused him to help us two days were thus occupied in covering eighteen miles it would have been less labor to have tied the beast put them into the boat and hauled it across the portage the weather was intensely hot and our time was made miserable by day with sand flies and by night with mosquitoes the waters of indian river were a most welcome sight and we hoped that most of our troubles were over paul and his bulls of bashan were gladly dismissed to the wilderness our first care was to make good any defects in our boat some leaks were stopped by a little caulking and pitching already our supply of provisions began to give us anxiety only bacon and sweet potatoes remained the meal was wet and worthless and what was worse all our salt had dissolved however with the waters alive with fish and some game on shore we hoped to pull through we reached indian river or lagoon opposite cape carnaveral it extends along nearly the entire eastern coast of florida varying in width from three to six miles and is separated from the atlantic by a narrow sand ridge which is pierced at different points by shifting inlets it is very shoal so much so that we were obliged to haul our boat out nearly half a mile before she would float and the water is teeming with stingrays swordfish crabs etc but once afloat we headed to the southward with a fair wind for four days we continued to make good progress taking advantage of every fair wind by night as well as by day here as on the st john's river the same scene of desolation as far as human beings were concerned was presented we passed a few deserted cabins around which we were able to obtain a few coconuts and watermelons a most welcome addition to our slim commissariat unfortunately oranges were not in season whenever the breeze left us the heat was almost suffocating there was no escape for it if we landed and sought any shade the mosquitoes would drive us at once to the glare of the sun when sleeping on shore the best protection was to bury ourselves in the sand with cap drawn down over the head my buckskin gauntlets proved invaluable if in the boat to wrap the sail or tarpaulin around us besides this plague sand flies gnats swamp flies ants and other insects abounded the little black ant is especially bold and warlike if in making our beds in the sand we disturbed one of their hives they would rally in thousands to the attack and the only safety was in a hasty shake and change of residence passing indian river inlet the river broadens and there is a thirty mile straightway course to gilbert's bar or old inlet now closed 
then begin the jupiter narrows where the channel is crooked narrow and often almost closed by the dense growth of mangroves juniper sawgrass etc making a jungle that only a water snake could penetrate several times we lost our reckoning and had to retreat and take a fresh start an entire day was lost in these everglades which extend across the entire peninsula finally by good luck we stumbled on a short haulover to the sea and determined at once to take advantage of it and to run our boat across and launch her in the atlantic a short half mile over the sand dunes and we were clear of the swamps and marshes of indian river and were reveling in the atlantic free at least for a time from mosquitoes which had punctured and bled us for the last three weeks on sunday june four we passed jupiter inlet with nothing in sight the lighthouse had been destroyed the first year of the war from this point we had determined to cross florida channel to the bahamas about eighty miles but the wind was ahead and we could do nothing but work slowly to the southward waiting for a slant it was of course a desperate venture to cross this distance in a small open boat which even a moderate sea would swamp our provisions now became a very serious question as i have said we had lost all the meal and the sweet potatoes our next mainstay were sufficient only for two days more we had but little more ammunition than was necessary for our revolvers and these we might be called upon to use at any time very fortunately for us it was the time of the year when the green turtle deposits its eggs russell and o'toole were old beachcombers and had hunted eggs before sharpening a stick they pressed it into the sand as they walked along and whenever it entered easily they would dig after some hours search we were successful in finding a nest which had not been destroyed and i do not think prospectors were ever more gladdened by the sight of the yellow than we were at our find the green turtle's egg is about the size of a walnut with a white skin like parchment that you can tear but not break the yolk will cook hard but the longer you boil the egg the softer the white becomes the flavor is not unpleasant and for the first two days we enjoyed them but then we were glad to bury the fare with a few shellfish and even with snails from cape carnaveral to cape florida the coast trends nearly north and south in a straight line so that we could see at a long distance anything going up or down the shore some distance to the southward of jupiter inlet we saw a steamer coming down running close to the beach to avoid the three and four knot current of the stream from her yards and general appearance i soon made her out to be a cruiser so we hauled our boat well up on the sands turned it over on its side and went back among the palmettos when abreast of us and not more than half a mile off with colors flying we could see the officer of the deck and others closely scanning the shore we were in hopes they would look upon our boat as flotsam and jetsam of which there was more or less strewn upon the beach to our great relief the cruiser passed us and when she was two miles or more to the southward we ventured out and approached the boat but the sharp lookout saw us and to our astonishment the steamer came swinging about and headed up the coast the question at once arose what was the best course to pursue the general thought we had better take to the bush again and leave the boat hoping they would not disturb it colonel wilson agreed with his chief i told him that since we had been seen the enemy would certainly destroy or carry off the boat and the loss meant if not starvation at least privation and no hope of escaping from the country besides the mosquitoes would suck us dry as egyptian mummies i proposed that we should meet them half way in company with russell and o'toole who were paroled men and fortunately had their papers with them and i offered to row off and see what was wanted he agreed and launching our boat and throwing in two buckets of eggs we pulled out by this time the steamer was abreast of us and had lowered a boat which met us half way i had one oar and o'toole the other to the usual hail i paid no attention except to stop rowing a tin-oared cutter with a smart-looking crew dashed alongside the sheen was not yet off the lace and buttons of the youngster in charge 
with revolver in hand he asked us who we were where we came from and where we were going cap'n said i please put away our, our pistol i don't like the looks of it and i'll tell you all about us we've been rebs and there ain't no use saying we weren't but it's all up now and we got home too late to put in a crop so we just made up our minds to come down shore and see if we couldn't find something it's all right cap'n we've got our papers want to see em got em fixed up at jacksonville o'toole and russell handed him their paroles which he said were all right he asked for mine i turned my pockets out looked in my hat and said i must have dropped mine in camp but it's just the same as theirn he asked who was ashore and i told him there's more of wins bilin some turtle eggs for dinner cap'n i'd like to swap some eggs for tobacco or bread his crew soon produced from the slack of their frocks pieces of plug which they passed on board in exchange for our eggs i told the youngster if he'd come to camp we'd give him as many as he could eat our hospitality was declined among other questions he asked if there were any batteries on shore a battery on a beach where there was not a white man within a hundred miles up oars let go forward let fall give way were all familiar orders but never before had they sounded so welcome as they shoved off the coxswain said to the youngster ah, it looks like a man o' war's gig sir but he paid no attention to him we pulled leisurely ashore watching the cruiser the boat went up to the davits at a run and she started to the southward again the general was very much relieved for it was a narrow escape the wind still holding to the southward and eastward we could work only slowly to the southward against wind and current at times we suffered greatly for want of water our usual resource was to dig for it but often it was so brackish and warm that when extreme thirst forced its use the consequences were violent pains and retchings one morning we saw a few wigwams ashore and pulled in at once and landed it was a party of seminoles who had come out of the everglades like the bears to gather eggs they received us kindly and we devoured ravenously the remnants of their breakfast of fish and kunti only the old chief spoke a little english not more than two or three hundred of this once powerful and warlike tribe remain in florida they occupy some islands in this endless swamp to the southward of lake okeechobee they have but little intercourse with the whites and come out on the coast only at certain seasons to fish we were very anxious to obtain some provisions from them but excepting kunti they had nothing to spare this is an esculent resembling arrowroot which they dig pulverize and use as flour cooked in the ashes it makes a palatable but tough cake which we enjoyed after our long abstinence from bread the old chief took advantage of our eagerness for supplies and determined to replenish his powder horn nothing else would do not even an old coat or fish hooks or a cavalry saber would tempt him powder only he would have for their long heavy small bore rifles with flint locks such as davy crockett used we reluctantly divided with him our very scant supply in exchange for some of their flour we parted good friends after smoking the pipe of peace on the seventh off new river inlet we discovered a small sail standing to the northward the breeze was very light so we downed our sail got out our oars and gave chase the stranger stood out to seaward and endeavored to escape but slowly we overhauled her and finally a shot caused her mainsail to drop as we pulled alongside i saw from the dress of the crew of three that they were man of war's men and divined that they were deserters they were thoroughly frightened at first for our appearance was not calculated to impress them favorably to our questions they returned evasive answers or were silent and finally asked by what authority we had overhauled them we told them that the war was not over so far as we were concerned that they were our prisoners and their boat our prize that they were both deserters and pirates the punishment of which was death but that under the circumstances we would not surrender them to the first cruiser we met but would take their paroles and exchange boats to this they strenuously objected they were well armed and although we outnumbered them five to three not counting tom still if they could get the first beat on us the chances were about equal they were desperate and not disposed to surrender their boat without a tussle 
the general and i stepped into their boat and ordered the spokesman and leader to go forward he hesitated a moment and two revolvers looked him in the face sullenly he obeyed our orders the general said wilson disarm that man the colonel with pistol in hand told him to hold up his hands he did so while the colonel drew from his belt a navy revolver and a sheath knife the other two made no further show of resistance but handed us their arms the crew disposed of i made an examination of our capture unfortunately her supply of provisions was very small only some salt horse and hardtack with a breaker of fresh water and we exchanged part of them for some of our conati and turtle's eggs but it was in our new boat that we were particularly fortunate sloop rigged not much longer than our gig but with more beam and plenty of freeboard decked over to the mast and well found in sails and rigging after our experience in a boat the gunwale of which was not more than eighteen inches out of the water we felt that we had a craft able to cross the atlantic our prisoners submitting to the inevitable soon made themselves at home in their new boat became more communicative and wanted some information as to the best course by which to reach jacksonville or savannah we were glad to give them the benefit of our experience and on parting handed them their knives and two revolvers for which they were very thankful later we were abreast of green turtle key with wind light and ahead still with all these drawbacks we were able to make some progress our new craft worked and sailed well after a little addition of ballast before leaving the coast we found it would be necessary to call at fort dallas or some other point for supplies it was running a great risk for we did not know whom we should find there whether friend or foe but without at least four or five days rations of some kind it would not be safe to attempt the passage across the gulf stream however before venturing to do so we determined to try to replenish our larder with eggs landing on the beach we hunted industriously for some hours literally scratching for a living but the ground had evidently been most effectually gone over before as the tracks of bears proved a few onions washed from some passing vessel were eagerly devoured we scanned the washings along the strand in vain for anything that would satisfy hunger nothing remained but to make the venture of stopping at the fort this fort like many others was established during the seminole war and at its close was abandoned it is near the mouth of the miami river a small stream which serves as an outlet to the overflow of the everglades its banks are crowded to the water's edge with tropical verdure with many flowering plants and creepers all the colors of which are reflected in its clear waters the old barracks were in sight as we slowly worked our way against the current located in a small clearing with coconut trees in the foreground the white buildings made with a backing of deep green a very pretty picture we approached cautiously not knowing with what reception we should meet as we neared the small wharf we found waiting some twenty or thirty men of all colors from the pale yankee to the ebony congo all armed a more motley and villainous looking crew never trod the deck of one of captain kidd's ships we saw at once with whom we had to deal deserters from the army and navy of both sides with a mixture of spaniards and cubans outlaws and renegades a burly villain towering head and shoulders above his companions and whose shaggy black head scorned any covering hailed us in broken english and asked who we were wreckers i replied that we left our vessel outside and had come in for water and provisions he asked where we had left our vessel and her name evidently suspicious which was not surprising for our appearance was certainly against us our headgear was unique the general wore a straw hat that napped over his head like the ears of an elephant colonel wilson an old cavalry cap that had lost its visor another a turban made of some number four duck canvas and all were in our shirt sleeves the colors of which were as varied as joseph's coat i told him we had left her to the northard a few miles that a gunboat had spoken us a few hours before and had overhauled our papers and had found them all right 
after a noisy powwow we were told to land that our papers might be examined i said no but if a canoe were sent off i would let one of our men go on shore and buy what we wanted i was determined not to trust our boat within a hundred yards of the shore finally a canoe paddled by two negroes came off and said no one but the captain would be permitted to land o'toole volunteered to go but the boatmen would not take him evidently having had their orders i told them to tell their chief that we had intended to spend a few pieces of gold with them but since he would not permit it we would go elsewhere for supplies we got out our sweeps and moved slowly down the river a light breeze helping us the canoe returned to the shore and soon some fifteen or twenty men crowded into four or five canoes and dugouts and started for us we prepared for action determined to give them a warm reception even tom looked after his carbine putting on a fresh cap End of section sixteen Section 17 of Famous Adventures and Prison Escapes of the Civil War by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 17, Escape of General Breckinridge, Part 2. Though outnumbered three to one, still we were well under cover in our boat and could rake each canoe as it came up. We determined to take all the chances and to open fire as soon as they came within range i told russell to try a shot at one some distance ahead of the others he broke two paddles on one side and hit one man not a bad beginning this canoe dropped to the rear at once the occupants of the others opened fire but their shooting was wild from the motions of their small craft the general tried and missed tom thought he could do better than his master and made a good line shot but short the general advised husbanding our ammunition until they came within easy range waiting a little while russell and the colonel fired together and the bowman in the nearest canoe rolled over nearly upsetting her they were now evidently convinced that we were in earnest and after giving us an ineffectual volley paddled together to hold a council of war soon a single canoe with three men started for us with a white flag we hove to and waited for them to approach. When within hail, I asked what was wanted. A white man, standing in the stern with two negroes paddling, replied, What did you fire on us for? We are friends. Friends do not give chase to friends. We wanted to find out who you are. I told you who we are, and if you are friends, sell us some provisions. Come on shore, and you can get what you want our wants were urgent and it was necessary if possible to make some terms with them but it would not be safe to venture near their lair again we told them that if they would bring us some supplies we would wait and pay them well in gold the promise of gold served as a bait to secure some concession after some parleying it was agreed that o'toole should go on shore in their canoe be allowed to purchase some provisions and return in two hours the buccaneer thought the time too short but i insisted that if o'toole were not brought back in two hours i would speak the first gunboat i met and return with her and have their nest of freebooters broken up time was important for we had noticed soon after we had started down the river a black column of smoke ascending from near the fort undoubtedly a signal to some of their craft in the vicinity to return for i felt convinced that they had other craft besides canoes at their disposal hence their anxiety to detain us o'toole was told to be as dumb as an oyster as to ourselves but wide awake as to the designs of our dubious friends the general gave him five eagles for his purchase tribute money he jumped into the canoe and all returned to the fort we dropped anchor underfoot to await his return keeping a sharp lookout for any strange sail the two hours passed in pleasant surmises as to what he would bring off another half hour passed and no sign of his return and we began to despair of our anticipated feast and of o'toole a bright young irishman whose good qualities had endeared him to us all 
the anchor was up and slowly with a light breeze we drew away from the river debating what should be our next move the fort was shut in by a projecting point and three or four miles had passed when the welcome sight of a canoe astern made us heave to it was o'toole with two negroes a bag of hard bread two hams and some rusty salt pork sweet potatoes fruit and most important of all two breakers of water and a keg of new england rum while o'toole gave us his experience a ham was cut and a slice between two of hardtack washed down with the jorum of rum and water with a dessert of oranges and bananas was a feast to us more enjoyable than any ever eaten at delmonico's or the cafe riche on his arrival on shore our ambassador had been taken to the quarters of major valdez who claimed to be an officer of the federals and by him he was thoroughly cross-examined he had heard of the breaking up of the confederacy but not of the capture of mr davis and was evidently skeptical of our story as to being wreckers and connected us in some way with the losing party either as persons of note or a party escaping with treasure however o'toole baffled all his queries and was proof against both blandishments and threats he learned what he had expected that they were looking for the return of a schooner hence the smoke signal and the anxiety to detain us as long as possible it was only when he saw us leaving after waiting over two hours that the major permitted him to make a few purchases and rejoin us night coming on found us inside of key biscayne the beginning of the system of innumerable keys or small islands extending from this point to the tortugas nearly two hundred miles east and west at the extremity of the peninsula of coral formation as soon as it is built up to the surface of the water it crumbles under the action of the sea and sun sea-fowl rest upon it dropping the seed of some marine plants or the hard mangrove is washed ashore on it and its all-embracing roots soon spread in every direction so are formed these keys darkness and shoal water warned us to anchor we passed an unhappy night fighting mosquitoes as the sun rose we saw to the eastward a schooner of thirty or forty tons standing down toward us with a light wind no doubt it was one from the fort sent in pursuit up anchor up sail out sweeps and we headed down biscayne bay a shoal sheet of water between the reefs and mainland the wind rose with the sun and being to windward the schooner had the benefit of it first and was fast overhauling us the water was shoaling which i was not sorry to see for our draught must have been from two to three feet less than that of our pursuer and we recognized that our best chance of escape was by drawing him into shoal water while keeping afloat ourselves by the color and break of the water i saw that we were approaching a part of the bay where the shoals appeared to extend nearly across with narrow channels between them like the furrows of a ploughed field with occasional openings from one channel into another some of the shoals were just awash others bare ahead was a reef on which there appeared but very little water i could see no opening into the channel beyond to attempt to haul by the wind on either tack would bring us in a few minutes under fire of the schooner now coming up hand over hand i ordered the ballast to be thrown overboard and determined as our only chance to attempt to force her over the reef she was headed for what looked like a little breakwater on our port bow as the ballast went overboard we watched the bottom anxiously the water shoaled rapidly and the grating of the keel over the coral with that peculiar tremor most unpleasant to a seaman under any circumstances told us our danger as the last of the ballast went overboard she forged ahead and then brought up together we went overboard and sank to our waists in the black pasty mud through which at intervals branches of rotten coral projected which only served to make the bottom more treacherous and difficult to work on relieved of a half ton of our weight our sloop forged ahead three or four lengths and then brought up again we pushed her forward some distance but as the water lessened notwithstanding our efforts she stopped 
looking astern we saw the schooner coming up wing and wing not more than a mile distant certainly the prospect was blue but one chance was left to sacrifice everything in the boat without hesitation overboard went the provisions except a few biscuits the oars were made fast to the main sheet alongside and a breaker of water the anchor and chain all spare rope indeed everything that weighed a pound was dropped alongside and then three on each side our shoulders under the boat's bilges at the word we lifted together and foot by foot moved her forward sometimes the water would deepen a little and relieve us again it would shoal between the coral branches we would sink at times to our necks in the slime and water our limbs lacerated with the sharp projecting points fortunately the wind helped us keeping all sail on thus for more than a hundred yards we toiled until the water deepened and the reef was passed wet foul bleeding with hardly strength enough to climb into the boat we were safe at last for a time as we cleared the shoal the schooner hauled by the wind and opened fire from a nine or twelve pounder but we were at long range and the firing was wild with a fair wind we soon opened the distance between us general breckinridge thoroughly used up threw himself down in the bottom of the boat at which tom always on the lookout for his master's comfort said mars john s'pose you take a little rum and water this proposal stirred us all the general rose saying uh, yes indeed tom i will but where is the rum supposing it had been sacrificed with everything else i sees you pitchin everything away i just put this jug in ya cause i lowed you'd want some opening a locker in the transom he took out the jug never was a potion more grateful we were faint and thirsty and it acted like a charm and bringing up on another reef we were ready for another tussle fortunately this proved only a short lift in the meantime the schooner had passed through the first reef by an opening as her skipper was undoubtedly familiar with these waters still another shoal was ahead instead of again lifting our sloop over it i hauled by the wind and stood for what looked like an opening to the eastward our pursuers were on the opposite tack and fast approaching a reef intervened and when a beam distant about half a mile they opened fire both with their small arms and boat gun the second shot from the latter was well directed it grazed our mast and carried away the luff of the mainsail several minnie balls struck on our sides without penetrating we did not reply and kept under cover when abreast of a break in the reef we up helm and again went off before the wind the schooner was now satisfied that she could not overhaul us and stood off to the northward free from our enemy we were now able to take stock of our supplies and determine what to do our provisions consisted of about ten pounds of hard bread a twenty-gallon breaker of water two-thirds full and three gallons of rum really a fatality appeared to follow us as regards our commissariat beginning with our first drenching on the st john's every successive supply had been lost and now what we had bought with so much trouble yesterday the sellers compelled us to sacrifice to-day but our first care was to ballast the sloop for without it she was so crank as to be unseaworthy this was not an easy task the shore of all the keys as well as that of the mainland in sight was low and swampy and covered to the water's edge with a dense growth of mangroves what made matters worse we were without any ground tackle at night we were up to elliot's key and anchored by making fast to a sweep shoved into the muddy bottom like a shad pole when the wind went down the mosquitoes came off in clouds we wrapped ourselves in the sails from head to feet with only our nostrils exposed at daylight we started again to the westward looking for a dry spot where we might land get ballast and possibly some supplies a few palm trees rising from the mangroves indicated a spot where we might find a little terra firma going in as near as was prudent we waded ashore and found a small patch of sand and coral elevated a few feet above the everlasting swamp 
some six or eight coca palms rose to the height of forty or fifty feet and under their umbrella-like tops we could see the bunches of green fruit it was a question how to get at it without saying a word tom went on board the boat brought off a piece of canvas cut a strip a yard long tied the ends together and made two holes for his big toes the canvas stretched between his feet embraced the rough bark so that he rapidly ascended he threw down the green nuts and cutting through the thick shell we found about half a pint of milk the general suggested a little milk punch all the trees were stripped and what we did not use we saved for sea stores to ballast our sloop was our next care the jib was unbent the sheet and head were brought together and made into a sack this was filled with sand and slung on an oar was shouldered by two and carried on board leaving us so engaged the general started to try to knock over some of the numerous waterfowl in sight he returned in an hour thoroughly used up from his struggles in the swamp but with two pelicans and a white crane in the stomach of one of the first were a dozen or more mullet from six to nine inches in length which had evidently just been swallowed we cleaned them and wrapping them in palmetto leaves roasted them in the ashes and they proved delicious tom took the birds in hand and as he was an old campaigner who had cooked everything from a stalled ox to a crow we had faith in his ability to make them palatable he tried to pick them but soon abandoned it and skinned them we looked on anxiously ready after our first course of fish for something more substantial he broiled them and with a flourish laid one before the general on a clean leaf saying as feared marsh john it's tough as an old muscovy drake let me try it tom after some exertion he cut off a mouthful while we anxiously awaited the verdict without a word he rose and disappeared into the bushes returning in a few minutes he told tom to remove the game his tone and expression satisfied us that pelican would not keep us from starving the colonel thought the crane might be better but a taste satisfied us that it was no improvement hungry and tired it was nearly night before we were ready to move and warned by our sanguinary experience of the previous night we determined to haul off from the shore as far as possible and get outside the range of the mosquitoes it was now necessary to determine upon our future course we had abandoned all hope of reaching the bahamas and the nearest foreign shore was that of cuba distant across the gulf stream from our present position about two hundred miles or three or four days sail with the winds we might expect at this season with the strictest economy our provisions would not last so long however nearly a month in the swamps and among the keys of florida in the month of june had prepared us to face almost any risk to escape from those shores and it was determined to start in the morning for cuba well out in the bay we hove to and passed a fairly comfortable night next day early we started for caesar's canal a passage between elliott's key and key largo the channel was crooked and puzzling leading through a labyrinth of mangrove islets around which the current of the gulf stream was running like a sluice we repeatedly got aground when we would jump aboard and push off so we worked all day before we were clear of the keys and outside among the reefs which extend three or four miles beyond waiting again for daylight we threaded our way through them and with a light breeze from the eastward steered south thankful to feel again the pulsating motion of the ocean several sail and one steamer were in sight during the day but all at a distance constant exposure had tanned us the color of mahogany and our legs and feet were swollen and blistered from being so much in the salt water and the action of the hot sun on them made them excessively painful fortunately but little exertion was now necessary and our only relief was in lying still with an impromptu awning over us general breckinridge took charge of the water and rum doling it out at regular intervals a tot at a time determined to make it last as long as possible toward evening the wind was hardly strong enough to enable us to hold our own against the stream 
at ten carriesford light was abeam and soon after a dark bank of clouds rising in the eastern sky betokened a change of wind and weather everything was made snug and lashed securely with two reefs in the mainsail and the bonnet taken off the jib i knew from experience what we might expect from summer squalls in the straits of florida i took the helm the general the sheet colonel wilson was stationed by the halyards russell and o'toole were prepared to bail tom thoroughly demoralized was already sitting in the bottom of the boat between the general's knees the sky was soon completely overcast with dark lowering clouds the darkness which could almost be felt was broken every few minutes by lurid streaks of lightning chasing one another through black abysses fitful gusts of wind were the heralds of the coming blast great drops of rain fell like the scattering fire of a skirmish line and with a roar like a thousand trumpets we heard the blast coming giving us time only to lower everything and get the stern of the boat to it for our only chance was to run with the storm until the rough edge was taken off and then heave to i cried all hands down as the gale struck us with the force of a thunderbolt carrying a wall of white water with it which burst over us like a cataract i thought we were swamped as i clung desperately to the tiller though thrown violently against the boom but after the shock our brave little boat though half filled rose and shook herself like a spaniel the mast bent like a whip-stick and i expected to see it blown out of her but gathering way we flew with the wind the surface was lashed into foam as white as the driven snow the lightning and artillery of the heavens were incessant blinding and deafening involuntarily we bowed our heads utterly helpless soon the heavens were opened and the floods came down like a waterspout i knew then that the worst of it had passed and though one fierce squall succeeded another each one was tamer the deluge too helped to beat down the sea to give an order was impossible for i could not be heard i could only during the flashes make signs to russell and o'toole to bail tying themselves and their buckets to the thwarts they went to work and soon relieved her of a heavy load from the general direction of the wind i knew without compass or any other guide that we were running to the westward and i feared were gradually approaching the dreaded reefs where in such a sea our boat would have been reduced to matchwood in a little while therefore without waiting for the wind or sea to moderate i determined to heave to hazard as it was to attempt anything of the kind giving the colonel the helm i lashed the end of the gaff to the boom and then loosed enough of the mainsail to goose-wing it or make a leg of mutton sail of it then watching for a lull or a smooth time i told him to put the helm a starboard and let her come to on the port tack head to the southward and at the same time i hoisted the sail she came by the wind quickly without shipping a drop of water but as i was securing the halyards the colonel gave her too much helm bringing the wind on the other bow the boom flew round and knocked my feet from under me and overboard i went fortunately her way was deadened and as i came up i seized the sheet and with the general's assistance scrambled on board for twelve hours or more i did not trust the helm to any one the storm passed over to the westward with many a departing growl and threat but the wind still blew hoarsely from the eastward with frequent gusts against the stream making a heavy sharp sea in the trough of it the boat was becalmed but as she rose on the crest of the waves even the little sail set was as much as she could stand up under and she had to be nursed carefully for if she had fallen off one breaker would have swamped us or any accident to sail or spar would have been fatal but like a gull on the waters our brave little craft rose and breasted every billow by noon the next day the weather had moderated sufficiently to make more sail and the sea went down at the same time then hungry and thirsty tom was thought of during the gale he had remained in the bottom of the boat as motionless as a log as he was roused up he asked mars john where is you and why is you going for de lord i never want to see a boat again 
come tom get us something to drink and see if there is anything left to eat said the general but tom was helpless the general served out a small ration of water and rum every drop of which was precious our small store of bread was found soaked but laid in the sun it partly dried and was if not palatable at least a relief to hungry men during the next few days the weather was moderate and we stood to the southward several sail were in sight but at a distance we were anxious to speak one even at some risk for our supplies were down to a pint of rum in water each day under a tropical sun with two water-soaked biscuits on the afternoon of the second day a brig drifted slowly down toward us we made signals that we wished to speak her and getting out our sweeps pulled for her as we neared her the captain hailed and ordered us to keep off i replied that we were shipwrecked men and only wanted some provisions as we rounded to under his stern we could see that he had all his crew of seven or eight men at quarters he stood on the taffrail with a revolver in hand his two mates with muskets the cook with a huge tormentor and the crew with handspikes i tell you again keep off or i'll let fly captain we won't go on board if you will give us some provisions we are starving keep off i tell you boys make ready one of the mates drew a bead on me our eyes met in a line over the sights on the barrel i held up my right hand will you fire on an unarmed man captain you are no sailor or you would not refuse to help shipwrecked men how do i know who you are and i've got no grub to spare here is a passenger who is able to pay you said i pointing to the general yes i will pay for anything you let us have the captain now held a consultation with his officers and then said i'll give you some water and bread i've got nothing else but you must not come alongside a small keg or breaker was thrown overboard and picked up with a bag of fifteen or twenty pounds of hardtack this was the reception given us by the brig neptune of banger but when the time and place are considered we cannot wonder at the captain's precautions for a more piratical looking party than we never sailed the spanish main general breckinridge bronzed the color of mahogany unshaven with long mustache wearing a blue flannel shirt open at the neck exposing his broad chest with an old slouch hat was a typical buccaneer thankful for what we had received we parted company doubtless the captain reported on his arrival home a blood-curdling story of his encounter with pirates off the coast of cuba mars john i thought the war was done why didn't you tell dem folks who you was queried tom the general told tom they were yankees and would not believe us as dar any yankees where you goin cause if da is we best go back to old kentucky he was made easy on this point and with an increase in our larder became quite perky a change in the color of the water showed us that we were on soundings and had crossed the stream and soon after we came in sight of some rocky islets which i recognized as double-headed shot keys thus fixing our position for our chart with the rest of our belongings had disappeared or had been destroyed by water and as the heavens by day and night were our only guide our navigation was necessarily very uncertain for the next thirty miles our course to the southward took us over salt key bank where the soundings varied from three to five fathoms but so clear was the water that it was hard to believe that the coral the shells and the marine flowers were not within arm's reach fishes of all sizes and colors darted by us in every direction the bottom of the bank was a constantly varying kaleidoscope of beauty but to starving men with not a mouthful in our grasp this display of food was tantalizing russell who was an expert swimmer volunteered to dive for some conches and shellfish oysters there were none asking us to keep a sharp lookout on the surface of the water for sharks which generally swim with the dorsal fin exposed he went down and brought up a couple of live conches about the size of a man's fist breaking the shell we drew the quivering body out without its coat it looked like a huge grub and not more inviting the general asked tom to try it 
glory mars john i'm mighty hungry never so hungry since we been in de army and i'm just ready for old mule polecat or anything cept dis worm after repeated efforts to dissect it we agreed with tom and found it not more edible than a pickled football however russell diving again brought up bivalves with a very thin shell and beautiful colors in shape like a large pea-pod these we found tolerable they served to satisfy in some small degree our craving for food the only drawback was that eating them produced great thirst which is much more difficult to bear than hunger we found partial relief in keeping our heads and bodies wet with salt water on the sixth day from the florida coast we crossed nicholas channel with fair wind soon after we made the cuban coast and stood to the westward hoping to sight something which would determine our position after a run of some hours just outside of the coral reefs we sighted in the distance some vessels at anchor as we approached a large town was visible at the head of the bay which proved to be cardenas we offered prayerful thanks for our wonderful escape and anchored just off the custom house and waited some time for the health officer to give us practique but as no one came off in answer to our signals we went on shore to report at the custom house it was some time before i could make them comprehend that we were from florida and anxious to land their astonishment was great at the size of our boat and they could hardly believe we had crossed in it our arrival produced as much sensation as would that of a liner we might have been filibusters in disguise the governor-general had to be telegraphed to numerous papers were made out and signed a register was made out for the sloop no name then we had to make a visit to the governor before we were allowed to go to a hotel to get something to eat after a cup of coffee and a light meal i had a warm bath and donned some clean linen which our friends provided we were overwhelmed with attentions and when the governor-general telegraphed that general breckinridge was to be treated as one holding his position and rank the officials became as obsequious as they had been overbearing and suspicious the next day one of the governor-general's aides-de-camp arrived from havana and with an invitation for the general and the party to visit him which we accepted and after two days rest took the train for the capital a special car was placed at our disposal and on our arrival the general was received with all the honors we were driven to the palace had a long interview and dined with governor-general concha the transition from a small open boat at sea naked and starving to the luxuries and comforts of civilized life was as sudden as it was welcome and thoroughly appreciated at havana our party separated general breckinridge and colonel wilson have since crossed the great river russell and o'toole returned to florida i should be glad to know what has become of faithful tom end of section seventeen end of famous adventures and prison escapes of the civil war by various